All right. So today's lesson is going to be on multicellularity. That means that we're done the first half of the unit. Okay? First half of the unit is about individual cells and their functioning and their transport and all of that kind of stuff. Now we're moving on to multicellular organisms. Right? And that's why we looked at that stuff on surface area and volume yesterday. Okay? And we pointed out how, my, how that multi-micro cube, the one with all the little cubes inside, that's like a multicellular organism. Okay? You overcome that surface area to volume ratio problem by becoming multicellular. Then every piece of you still has a good surface area to volume ratio, but you can become very large. Okay? And throughout the geological history of Earth, okay, we have seen an evolutionary advantage to being bigger. Okay? In almost every instance, being bigger has been better, except in times of maybe extreme stress like 65 million years ago. Okay? At the end of the Cretaceous period, being bigger was definitely not better. Okay? And basically the only things that survived were small. Right? But that's pretty few and far between. Generally, being bigger is better. All right? um, so that would have served a pretty major competitive advantage okay, in natural selection okay, to be big. So we're going to look at how multicellularity evolved. And that's going to start out with us looking at kind of the history of the development of life on Earth. Right? Uh, and a bit of a comparison okay, uh, where we're going to talk about how um, what you might learn in religion class is in perfect agreement with what you are going to learn here about natural selection and evolution. Okay? Um, because there has been this idea, and at one point in history it was true that the Catholic Church did not agree with the idea of evolution. There was a time okay, where that was true. Okay? Luckily, you guys have possibly one of the greatest popes ever to live. Okay, being Pope right now. Okay, Pope Francis is awesome. Okay, this guy is very willing to look at things from a very objective place and say, this is how the Catholic Church feels about this and this is why. Okay, and totally willing to own mistakes. Okay, if there have been. And one of the things he did was very early on in, in his uh, um, rule here as Pope um, was to clear up this idea of the Catholic Church doesn't agree with evolution. Okay? Pope Francis actually has a degree in chemistry. Okay? He actually is a man of science as well. Um, he came out and said right away, look, the Catholic Church has zero problem with the idea of evolution and the idea of natural selection. And he said, and here's why. When God created the earth, he knew the earth was not going to be a static thing that would never change. He knew that through the history of the earth, the earth would have to change. In fact, that was his plan. His plan was that it would have to go through these stages of development in preparation for the arrival of man. Okay? And so, he would have come up with this idea that would have allowed the life he put on earth to change and adapt to the changes that were going to happen. Okay. So really, evolution is a tool okay, through which uh, God allows life to continue on Earth okay, and everywhere in the universe. Does that sort of make sense? Okay. So yeah, there's, there's no conflict between this idea that organisms that um, have a competitive advantage are going to survive and reproduce more than those who are less competitive or less well-equipped to the environment. Okay. That's just logical. Okay. And is that going to create changes in organisms over time? Absolutely, yes, it is. And the Catholic Church has no objection to that idea. Okay. That is how life survives, adapts, and changes okay, as the Earth changes. All right. So there's no, there's no conflict to that at all. In fact, when you look at the, the history of the Earth, the geologic history of the Earth, it actually follows the creation story in Genesis. Okay? Everything happens in the same order. All, right? all that's different is the time frame. Okay? How long did it take God to do everything? Six. Six. He rested on the seventh. That's the importance of the Sabbath day. Okay? Um, but yes, six days. All right. 
Are we to take that literally? No. In fact, most of the stuff in the Bible you're not to take literally. Jesus taught in parables all the time. Okay? You have to picture the time in which Jesus lived and the time when the people that wrote the Bible lived. It was a very different time. Most people at that time were illiterate, uneducated. Okay? All they needed to do each and every day was make sure enough food got on the table for everybody to stay alive. Okay? That was, was kind of their life. Okay? They didn't have time to study science and figure out how things were working. So stories were put into place to help explain how and why things came to be. Because people at that time, again, were not like overly educated, well-read, okay, things like that, they needed to put things in terms that they would understand and accept. Telling somebody that four and a half billion years ago, big rocks in space were accreting together due to gravity and forming a planetesimal that would eventually form the Earth, uh, and this you know primitive uh, layer of gases was surrounding it, which eventually cooled and you know blah blah blah. They would have looked at you and went, "We should throw rocks at this person until they're dead because they're crazy." Okay. They're, they're a heretic, or they're saying stuff that doesn't that I don't like, and whatever. That, and unfortunately, at that time, if you said something that kind of um, made you seem like you were really out there, that's what they did. They stoned you. Okay, so just so you know, if you got stoned in the Bible, it's a different kind of stoned. Okay, it's not like stoned. It's like stoned. Okay, thrown rocks at until dead. Okay, um, so it's yeah, very different. Um, so. We, we have to not take that, that whole time frame of seven days literally. Okay? We were never meant to take, take that literally. It was meant as an analogy that you could explain to people whose you know, frame of reference was much more simple. And to the people in that time, seven days was a sacred amount of time. Okay? So it made sense to do it that way. All right. So, multicellularity actually evolved several times throughout Earth's history. Okay? The two main or the three main groups that still exist today that are multicellular are animals, plants, and fungi. Okay? Those are the three multicellular groups of living organisms. Other groups have come and gone, okay, become extinct or whatever throughout Earth's history, but multicellularity has evolved in separate sets of organisms multiple times. If that's the case, it probably serves some sort of competitive advantage, okay, if multiple groups of organisms are developing it, okay. It's the same as flight, for example, okay. What, what uh, advantage does flight serve? If you're able to fly. Mm. Oh, no, um, they can get away from stuff. You can get away from stuff. What else can you do? You can hunt stuff better because you have a bird's eye view, okay, of everything, right? Flight is a major competitive advantage. That's why it's evolved, okay, in birds, okay, reptiles, although they're now extinct, okay, um, and insects, okay, all that stuff, right? We've got, okay, these things that are all capable of flight. Even mammals, right? Which mammals fly? Bats, yeah. okay? Flight serves a competitive advantage. Right? And so it's, it's evolved many, many times. Okay, so here's the kind of Cole's Notes version of Earth's geologic history. Okay, so 4.6 billion years ago or so, give or take, okay, um, the Earth is basically a molten ball of rock because the early heavy bombardment has been going on. Okay, and that was a period of time between about five billion years ago or so where the solar system was very different from what it is now. There would have been a ball of hot gas in the middle that was coalescing to form the sun, okay, and then all this rocky debris and gas in a cloud surrounding it. Okay? Gravitational attraction brought a lot of those rocks and gases and stuff towards the center, but on their way there, they would sometimes run into each other. Okay? And when they run into each other, there's a lot of heat generated, and lots of times that doesn't annihilate the two objects. It actually causes them to merge okay, and become one object. So early on in Earth's history, there was so much of this collision because there was just so much debris out there that big sections of rock started to coalesce. 
Okay? Um, so these became the planets. Uh, so in this period of time, 4.6 billion years ago, we've got Earth, okay, and it's got you know some gravitational pull. It's got some mass. It's a bit smaller uh, than it is right now, um, and there's you know a primitive envelope of gases around it, but not what we would consider to be an atmosphere, okay? And there's no let's say solid surface because it's very molten from all the impacts, okay? And impacts are common. As the amount of material out there starts to decrease because it's all collecting in these big masses no, that will become the planets, okay, the amount of bombardment decreases and so um, Earth begins to cool. As Earth begins to cool, okay, then uh, the gases begin to condense, water falls on the surface, we start getting oceans forming, okay, things like that, okay, and that's around like 4 billion years ago or so. Okay. Between 3.9 and 3.5 billion years ago, we get the first primitive living organisms showing up in the fossil record. Okay? These would have been very primitive photosynthetic bacteria called cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. Okay? They would have had the whole planet to themselves. All right? So they would have done very well. There was nothing to eat them. Okay? The only thing that, that would kill them would be getting struck by more meteors. Okay, uh, radical changes in pH or gas contents and things like that that could happen. Okay, um, so they kind of have reign of the Earth for you know 500 million to a billion years. Okay, they, there's a whole bunch of them that, that evolve, but they're all essentially similar. Okay, um, between 2.8 and 2.5 billion years, something big happens, and it almost wipes out all life on Earth. And it's that all the life on Earth changes the composition of the atmosphere to a tipping point, where it actually becomes toxic to just about everything that lives on Earth. Okay? Because what you've got are all these bacteria living on Earth that are carrying out photosynthesis in an atmosphere that is mostly carbon dioxide, ammonia, okay? which is that stuff you produced in the lab that smelled really bad. Okay? In the first, or sorry, in the chemical reactions lab, okay, and other gases that are basically trace amounts now in our modern atmosphere. So, the early Earth's atmosphere was very different and would be toxic to life now. But as all these photosynthetic organisms are carrying out photosynthesis, they're pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, pumping oxygen into the atmosphere, and since they're the only things there, the oxygen's not really getting consumed very much. And so suddenly the composition of the atmosphere reaches a tipping point to where now there's so much oxygen that it's actually toxic to 90% of the stuff that's living on Earth. And the first mass extinction happens, okay? Most of the living things on Earth die, except for the very few that could tolerate the high amounts of oxygen that were present, okay? Now, those ones now have reign of the Earth, okay? They've survived the toxic atmosphere and now reproduce and carry on and, and life goes on. Okay? And so what we see here, you see this blue line or bluish purple line here? This represents the diversity of life on Earth by its width. So you can see that back here it's very, very skinny. Okay? Um, so it's starting to get a little bit wider because now we're seeing that the organisms that survived the mass extinction are, are being um, are essentially evolving and diverging and making more different kinds of organisms. Okay. Um, 2.1 to 1.9 billion years ago, oxygen's building up, large single-celled organisms appear, and the first multicellular organisms appear here. Now, so this marks the start, this little yellow band here, marks the start of multicellular organisms. Look what happens to the width of the line. Once multicellular organisms appear on Earth, the diversity of life explodes. Okay? It just goes crazy. Okay? And that's just here. It even gets more diverse here okay? when we start getting animals, the first animals to appear. Because that opens up a whole new set of niches that can be filled. Okay. Um, if you look by like the 3.3 3 to 3.5 billion, there's yep. like a really tiny yellow line. Like right here? Yeah, what would that one stand for? Um, that, would be pro that would be that um, point where the atmosphere became toxic. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this, these are kind of mar marking different epochs. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought yeah. they were marking like different species. 
No, not so much different species, just different kind of important points, turning okay. points, right, in, in Earth's geologic history. Okay, so this is what we call the Cambrian explosion down here. Okay, the Cambrian explosion is when the again the first animals begin to appear. Right, the sponges were kind of right here. They're the first animals. They're not even really mobile. They just kind of sit there and filter feed from the uh, from the ocean. But there was lots to filter feed because there was algae everywhere. Okay, um, but then once you got organisms that were capable of moving, okay, and, and hunting and doing stuff like that, then everything just kind of takes off. Right? And that's not, this doesn't even go all the way to current time frame. Okay? This is still everything lives where? In the water. Okay? At this point, at the end of this diagram, everything still lives in the water. There's no life on the land yet. That's a whole other explosion okay? um, of life when life begins to colonize the solid parts of the earth and come out of the ocean. Okay, so that sort of makes sense? Okay, so as, as everything goes on, life adapts to the new situation. Okay? And we know that at various points in Earth's history, there have been really catastrophic things that have happened, but life always finds a way. Sure, it's kind of off topic, but is this kind of the reasoning to like, when well, scientists believe um, some of these aren't extinct, they're still in the ocean? Um, well, I mean, you can, you can say that there's a belief out there for that because we haven't seen anything living it, it's hard to make proof for it. I mean, we, we see like stuff like trilobites, for example. They had this period of time where they were everything when it came to animal life. And then they just disappear from the fossil record and we see nothing of them again. Okay? Since there's no other fossils of them for several hundred million years, we have to pretty much assume they're gone. Right? I mean, there's no, it's impossible to say that there isn't something living in the deep ocean depths that we haven't seen yet. Okay? I mean, they found the coelacanth, right? that, that armored fish they thought was dead, okay? the giant squid, okay? stuff like that. Yeah, sure, they, it's, it's hard to know what's down there, but the likelihood is pretty low. Yeah, yeah just because this gets me thinking, though. Because like, I remember seeing all these things, and it's like well, we know more about space than we do about the ocean. And if the, all these uh, animals are crawling out of the ocean onto land, then most of them should still be somewhere. Well, except that if something better has come along and it outcompeted them, they just die off. Okay. Right, and then we don't see them anymore. It's not that they've, you know, that they've been hiding. It's that they didn't compete as well as something better. Right. Oh yeah, and then I hate that you know, that's going to rock you to sleep tonight. But I mean, there's always there's always the possibility of something like that. Um, we don't really even know what caused necessarily all of the mass extinction. I mean, we have the you know the uh, asteroid impact. Um, theory, which has a lot of evidence to support it, and we even have the crater there in um, in Mexico. Okay, um, but it's it's hard to know. There's a lot of theories that say that some of these may have been um, caused by gamma ray bursts from supernovas that happened really far away, and the Earth just got bathed in radiation, and it basically killed everything off. Um, there's nothing to say that that kind of stuff can't happen when the Earth's poles flip. Okay, there's usually a blip. Okay, in the uh, in the amount of life that happens afterwards, and we're kind of in point where that's happening. Okay, when the Earth poles flip, the magnetic field disappears for a while, and we're exposed to far more radiation than normal. Okay, and the Earth is in the process of doing one of those. I'm not saying that's happening tomorrow or even in the next hundred years, but it will occur over the next ten thousand or so. Is at least what our geologic time frame says. So yeah, there's all kinds of things. We could get hit by a stray asteroid we don't see coming. Boom. Live your best life. <laughs> what would okay. you do if that happened? Like they announce it to us and everyone goes into global panic? Like yeah, I don't know. That's a totally yeah. different yeah. Uh, yeah. topic. Yeah. Is, uh, you know, do you tell people long they're long all going to die or do you just like let them live? <laughs> okay? Because, I mean, there's a certain argument to be said for, okay, we know everybody's going to die. If we tell them they're all going to die, they're all going to die faster. Yeah. Okay? Because people are crazy. Um, but yeah, it's. I don't know. That's a, that's a tough decision. I wouldn't want to be the person who has to make that decision. If it were me, I think if there was something like that was going to happen, don't tell me. Ignorance is bliss. There's nothing I can do to stop it. Right? I, I think even if I'm a prepper, getting hit by an asteroid is not something you prep for. And yeah, you're just dead. So, yeah. Let me live my best life and go on, right? All right. So. Now we got to talk about the difference between a multicellular organism 
and a colony of single-celled organisms working together, because they are different. Okay? The defining characteristic of a multicellular organism is this. Specialization. Specialization means that you have some cells that do this job. You have some cells that do this job. And those cells look different because they're specialized to do that thing. Can they do other things? Yes, but they're specialized to do this job. Okay? That's the defining characteristic of a true multicellular organism. This is not a multicellular organism. It's a group of single cells working together. It's a colony or a colonial organism. Okay? And the reason we say that is all of these cells are the same. the same. None of them are specialized to do a certain job. Okay? Each one of those cells is identical. They each have a feeding flagellum. They have a collar uh, to collect the food. They each have a nucleus and all that kind of stuff. They would all carry out all the functions of the organism equally. Okay? A specialized organism would have some cells that are specialized for feeding and some spell cells that are specialized for digestion and some cells that are specialized to do this and this and this. That would be a multicellular organism and the cells would all look different. Okay? If I take cells from uh, my brain, cells from my skin, cells from my muscles, cells from my heart and look at them all under the microscope, they all look very different. Do they all have a lot of similarities? Yes, they all have a nucleus, they all have mitochondria, all that kind of stuff. But they're different in structure. My muscle cells, like, so if I take you know, like cells from my heart, those are muscle cells, okay, they're going to have, they're going to be multinucleate. That means every one of the cells has more than one nucleus. All of those cells are going to have tons of um, like fibers, okay, cytoskeleton, stuff like that. It's connecting them, making them strong. They're also going to have way more mitochondria than a cell from my stomach, okay? Because muscles are going to use way more energy than my stomach cells are, okay? And so on and so on. So they're specialized to do this job, okay? Which is, um, you know, contract and relax, contract and relax and do mechanical work. Whereas cells from my stomach are going to have way more, uh, like, uh, smooth ER, okay, and, and way more, uh, like even maybe multiple Golgi apparatus and things like that to help them create digestive enzymes that can be used to digest food. All right, they're going to have way less mitochondria because they're not going to have the energy needs that a muscle cell would need. All right, you guys follow what specialization means there? Okay, so that's the key thing. This is a really important word when it comes to distinguishing between a multicellular organism and a colony of cooperating cells. Okay, so the evolution to multicellularity in involved increasing cellular specialization and division of labor. Okay, so initially we had the colonial aggregates, like that thing I showed you on the last slide. Okay, um, but obviously then there were going to be um, other organisms where instead of having five identical cells, they would have five cells, each which were different and doing a certain job, and that would have been more efficient. Okay? Having one cell that does a job very well versus five cells that all have to do that job, so-so, okay? you've got a, uh, an organism that's a jack of all trades and a master of none, and then you've got an organism that has five masters of different skills. Okay? That's going to be way more efficient than having five cells that have to try and do everything. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, so, Obviously, life on Earth had to go through a, a lot of kind of different changes and different adaptations. Okay? Uh, you can see that in a lot of these pictures, there's like meteors, right? Because the Earth got hit a lot, okay? A lot more often early on because there was just a lot more debris out there, okay? There's like the early heavy bombardment and the late heavy bombardment. There's these periods of time that we're all about being struck by stuff, okay? Uh, and so that happened quite often, all right? Um, you'll also notice in these two pictures, look at the moon. What do you notice about the moon? Yeah, it's huge. And it's huge because it is really close. 
Where'd the moon come from? Yeah. The moon was part of the Earth. Okay. Back about 4.3 billion years ago, I think or so, somewhere in there, between 4 and 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth was struck by a Mars-sized object. Okay? When that collision happened, it wasn't a head-on collision. Okay? It was a glancing blow. Okay? So more like a side swipe than a head-on collision. Okay? But the impactor, that is the smaller object, the Mars-sized object, was annihilated. Okay? And Earth was effectively also annihilated, but not powdered. Okay? The, the uh, smaller object was basically um, turned into a cloud of debris, and a bunch of it was absorbed into the Earth. Okay? So we had the Earth, and then we had this Mars-sized object that hit it kind of like this. So not head-on, but a glancing blow. Okay? And the debris from this was scattered into a cloud that surrounded the Earth. Okay? That debris coalesced into the moon, became the moon. Most of that debris was from the surface of the Earth. Because when this thing hit, it first essentially vaporized the surface of the Earth. Okay? And most of the debris that was chucked up into the air was the top layers of the Earth. Okay? And so the big heavy parts of this impactor merged with Earth, which is why Earth has a big, heavy, solid, or sorry, liquid iron core. Okay, and why Earth has a really strong magnetic field compared to the other um, terrestrial planets, okay, because of all this iron that's collected in there. Now, um, the moon, okay, all this debris just collects and forms the moon over, you know, a few hundred million years, okay, and um, now we've got this, you know, fairly large satellite. The, our moon is actually one of the larger moons in the solar system, okay, compared to the size of the Earth, we're more of a double planet system than a planet and a moon, okay, that the moon is actually that big. Um, I know you, you probably don't know, but like, how did it get into a circle? Because like, is that just kind of like a work of God? Because like, if it kind of gets hit and all the powder comes together, then wouldn't it be like a disassembled cube-looking thing? Well, no. The natural tendency of all objects is is to kind of coalesce and then distribute their mass evenly. Okay, so a circle is a very common, naturally occurring shape. The Earth is not a perfect circle. It's not flat. <laughs> okay. If you're a flat earther, you won't like anything I say. And that's because you're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> that flat earth crap is just crazy talk. Okay? Um, but yeah, it's, um, a sphere is a naturally occurring shape because it evenly distributes mass. Now, the earth is actually somewhat oblong. It's not a football, but it's not a basketball. Okay? It's kind of somewhere in between. The earth is wider at the equator than it is at the poles. In fact, it's so much wider at the equator than at the poles, that you're actually further from the center of the Earth, standing on the beach at sea level at the, at the equator, than you are standing on the top of Mount Everest. Okay? So the highest point on Earth is closer to the center of the Earth than if you're standing in the ocean at sea level at the equator. Weird but true. Okay? All right, so the Earth it, you know, reforms, cools, all this stuff comes back, but it's a pretty major setback, okay, uh, for the Earth in terms of its development. So it was delayed. Nothing was alive on Earth yet at that point, or at least we don't have any fossil record of it because, well, the Earth was annihilated, okay? Um, and so all of this debris coalesces, forms the moon, okay, the Earth is a bit bigger now, and a little heavier, okay, and it works a bit um, differently, but it cools off and starts kind of back on track for, for, for um, evolving life. Now, how do we know, or what is, what is the evidence that supports this impactor idea? Anybody know? There's a number of pieces of evidence that support that this is how the moon formed. Okay. Two big pieces of evidence are these. The moon, for its size, is very light. And its surface because we have soil samples from the moon, because we actually went there, okay? It's another conspiracy theory thing, okay? They did not fake the moon landing, yeah, all that stuff. Again, crazy talk, okay? But we have these samples that we brought back from the moon. And what we know is the moon and the earth are exactly the same age, 
and the moon is made out of exactly the same composition of materials as the Earth's surface. Okay? The moon does not have a dense iron core like the Earth does. And that supports this glancing blow hypothesis okay, that says most of the Earth's surface was stripped away and became the debris cloud that formed the moon. Okay? That's one thing. This is the other thing. In all those pictures, the moon was really close. It's not that close now. The moon is doing this. It is getting further and further away from the Earth all the time at a staggering two centimeters per year. Okay. On average, the moon moves away from the Earth by two centimeters per year. <laughs> How do we know this? We went to the moon and we put mirrors on the moon. And we shoot lasers at them for fun. Okay? And we measure the length of time it takes the lasers to travel there and back. Every time we do it, it takes a little longer. Okay? Because the Earth is the Earth and the Moon are getting a little bit further away all the time. Okay? So as we track this, you can, and we have enough data now because we've been doing it for you know, 40 years, okay? uh, we can backtrack it. And when we backtrack it, it shows the Moon coming from the Earth okay? at about four and a half billion years ago, of course. Um, wait, how did they do this, though? Would you like go to the Moon, take samples, and be like, oh, this kind of resembles the Earth, then come up with an hypothesis? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, people had that idea just from the celestial mechanics. People made observations and kind of knew that the moon was doing these things. Um, we also have evidence uh, in the geological record of tides being changing over Earth's history. So when the moon was much closer to the Earth, okay, the Earth actually spun faster. So as the moon moves away, Earth's days get longer. Now, I'm not talking about like any measurable amount of time, but as the moon moves away, the Earth's rate of rotation slows, so the days will get longer. So imagine when the moon was really close to the Earth, Earth was spinning faster, and the moon was going around faster as well. Okay? Imagine what happened to the tides then. Okay? Like for now we get like you know two high tides and two low tides every day. Well, imagine when the Earth is spinning around every eight hours. Okay, so a day lasts eight hours instead of 24, okay, and the moon is whipping around the earth a couple of times a day, okay? It's like somebody taking a, like a tub of water and doing this with it, shaking it back and forth, okay? The tides would have been not only huge, but happening all the time, okay? So that means there would have been huge influxes of nutrients and stuff like that coming from deep water, coming into shallow water where it was warmer, and all of those conditions were really good for the development of life. Oh, no, we're not talking like it was a sustained, and it's not something that can hurt anything either. Um, it's just a beam of light. We say a laser because it has to be a concentrated beam. Yeah. Okay, So we shoot that at the mirrors, and then we time how long it comes back. It doesn't take long. Like it, it's, it's literally like less than two seconds to go back and forth. Oh. Yeah. I mean, when, when we had people on the moon, if you ever listen to the recordings, there's this delay. Right? Like the, you'll hear the beep, and then there'll be a delay, and then you'll hear them. It's because the return time is you know, about a second and a half or so, because light only travels so fast, right? It takes eight and a half minutes okay, for light to get from the sun to the earth. Okay? So if the sun ever like, went out or blew up, we would know for eight minutes. Okay? And similarly, when we send probes to, to Mars, we can't land them remotely, because it takes, in, in a best case scenario, 10 minutes for the signal to get there and back. Okay? In a worst case scenario, when Earth is here and Mars is on the other side of the sun, it can be 40 minutes. Right? So we can't, we can't communicate live. If you've seen The Martian, that was one of the big things, right? They couldn't talk to each other. They had to type or record and then listen to the response. Okay, so hypothetically, if the okay. moon keeps getting further away from us, yep. time would end up being more. Like we'd have more than 24 hours in yeah, well, time won't change, but our day length will change, yes. 
Yeah, because the time is, is sort of, from yeah. our framework, is fixed, right? Yeah. 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 Okay, going with what Gigi's saying, um, like, in a trillion years from now, it, when the moon's, like, further enough away, does that mean the Earth would just, like, stop spinning? Yes. So there would be like humans who just live in complete darkness? And, and well, in a trillion years from now, the Earth and the Moon aren't going to be around. The sun's going to swallow us up in another like, you know, five billion years or so. so yeah. it's, it's, certainly not, it's certainly not a problem you have to worry about. Okay, so if you're, if you're starting to worry about that stuff, you can take it right off your plate, okay? None of this stuff is going to affect your life at all, or your kids' lives, or your grandkids' lives, or blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay? We're going to be long gone before any of that is a problem. Okay, making sense? So that kind of goes along with the conditions that had to be present for life to evolve. Okay? Having moving water and moving nutrients around is important because okay, those are all things that are necessary for, for life to evolve. There we go. Okay. Um, now, these are different types of cells. I'm never going to ask you about parenchyma cells. So, okay. This is just showing you examples of specialization in a multicellular organism. All right. So, in a plant, there are these parenchyma cells, which oddly are unspecialized. They can become anything. Right? So they become specialized, and then they become different types of cells within the plant. Okay? We call them something uh, you've probably heard of, stem cells. Have you heard of stem cells before? Okay? Plants have these cells, parenchyma cells, or stem cells, that can become any type of cell for the plant. And they're usually in new growth. So if a plant has got like a bud on it, the cells in that bud are going to be unspecialized, but they will become different parts of the leaf different parts of the stem, okay? um, you know, things like that. So they can become specialized to become any part of, uh, of the plant. Okay? Animals work a bit differently. Um, our stem cells that are like that are really only present when we're an embryo. Okay? Um, and that's usually when stem cells, the kind that you've heard about, okay, are harvested. Okay? Um, it's actually why the Catholic Church does not support embryonic stem cell research. Okay, to harvest embryonic stem, stem cells, where do you have to get them from? An embryo. So if I take an embryo, which is a fertilized egg, okay, and the Catholic Church be believes that life begins at the moment of conception, okay, so that's when sperm meets egg, it's a single cell then. Okay, an embryo is many cells. Okay, if you're going to take embryonic stem cells, so you go into the embryo and you suck out a few cells, well, you just sucked out the cells that were going to become its liver or its brain, or its muscles, okay? If you take those out, what happens to the embryo? It dies, okay? Which in the Catholic Church's beliefs is that you have, you have killed. You, this, that was a living thing that had the potential to be a person, okay? And as a result, that's wrong, okay? That's, that's what the Catholic Church believes, okay? That's why the Catholic Church opposes abortion. It's the same idea. Okay? The moment of conception is when life begins because that is when the genetic potential for a person is present. Uh, so if someone has a miscarriage, yeah. that work as well? Um, it could, but here's the problem. There's usually a genetic reason for the miscarriage. So you wouldn't want to harvest stem cells from a, a fetus or embryo that was um, spontaneously terminated. So what do they use the stem cells for? Like, if you said, if it's like this, where mm -hmm. it like can do anything, is that what they use it on people? Like yeah. So the modern stem cell research is growing tissue from these stem cells to be grafted into people. Okay. I mean, the, the medical applications of this are huge. If I'm a person who has really bad type 1 diabetes, my pancreas just does not work. Okay. Um, if they grow pancreatic tissue from a stem cell and then surgically graft it onto my pancreas, I will no longer have type 1 diabetes. I'll have cell cells in my body that can make insulin and I will be essentially cured. Okay? Um, some of it is for you know, just being able to grow like liver tissue to graft onto um, a failing organ rather than having to go through a whole liver transplant which has its own risks and, and um, you know, problems afterwards and all that. 
I could just graft this tissue on and there'd be less chance of rejection, less you know, major surgery, you know, that kind of stuff. It's not removing the organ and replacing it, it's just grafting it on. Um, same, there's also some being done um, to uh, fix paralysis. So if someone's spinal cord is severed, they're looking at growing spinal nerves that can be grafted over the break. I actually saw when I was in university, they did this with rats. So they would like sever the rat's spinal cord and then they would graft the nerves across and they would actually regain partial use of the limb below the, the break. So there's a lot of applications for it, but the, the cost is where are we getting them from? Like certainly the benefits are there and people are like, yeah, we want the benefits, but there's not always the understanding of the cost of it. Where is it coming from? So what Canada and the US and a lot of other countries are doing is they're saying, no, we're not gonna support embryonic stem cell research because you know, in general, these are countries where their values say that that's not right. Um, but what they are looking at is pluripotent stem cell research. Our bodies produce what are called pluripotent stem cells. They're not as good as embryonic stem cells for this use, but they are fairly useful. And we use them already for some things. Um, there's a procedure for uh, fixing osteoarthritis where they do a liposuction, so they suck out some of your fat, and in the fat are stem cells, pluripotent stem cells, and they'll actually inject those into the knee, and they will help to regrow cartilage, which can help with arthritis. So if the patient is supported, getting it from the US, can No, because the plants can only become plant cells. Right, like they only have the genetic potential to produce whatever the plant needs. So yeah, I can't harvest them from a plant and go, all right, I'm in the go, yeah. right? I, then I'll turn green. <laughs> no, I won't turn green, but yeah, it just, it won't work because they can't become what I need them to become, right? My body would send chemical signals to say, do this, and they wouldn't do it, right? Because they don't have the genetic code to make those things. They can make just what's in the plant. No, that's a good question. Okay, um, so. Specialization, that was what we said was the most important thing for um, a multicellular organism. So there could be water conducting cells, they're specialized, they have different shape, they fit together tightly so that water doesn't leak out, stuff like that, okay? Um, there's sugar conducting cells, okay, that, that are specialized to conduct the sap that's in a plant so they're thicker and wider, okay, things like that. This is our main example of specialization. The layers of the leaf. You looked at this in the cell anatomy lab, right? The layers of the leaf is going to be our number one example of specialization. So really make note of this because I will ask you about this on the test. I guarantee it, okay? Layers of the leaf explain how this shows true multicellularity. So now I'm going to explain it, okay? So in the layers of the leaf, Okay, we've got on the top and on the bottom, okay, an upper epidermis, okay? The cells in the upper epidermis have almost no chloroplasts, okay? Their job is not to carry out photosynthesis. They are specialized to produce a waxy film called the cuticle that coats the leaf. If you've ever touched the leaf of a plant, it feels kind of waxy. When water hits it, it beads and rolls off, just like it does on a car that's just been waxed, okay? So um, they secrete this waxy cuticle. What the waxy cuticle does is prevents water from evaporating from the entire surface of the leaf. If a plant doesn't have that, it can dry out very quickly. So as an example, moss does not have a waxy cuticle. You put moss in the sun and it's crunchy in no time, okay? You put a regular plant in the sun and it does just fine. It has this waxy cuticle that is secreted by the upper epidermis. Okay? So those cells are specialized to be pretty much transparent so the light can get through them and to secrete the waxy cuticle. Now, there's a drawback. These cells don't carry out photosynthesis. Where do they get their sugar from? The one below them. Okay, a multicellular organism has specialization, but it's also interdependent. Okay, you heard we, we used that term before. Okay, one set of cells that's doing this job and is really good at it, really sucks at this job. Okay, and so it depends on the ones that are really good at that job. Right, I mean, it's, it's no different than human society. 
okay? Some of us are really good at one thing, okay? Like, uh, and, but we're dependent on somebody else to provide us with food, okay? You know, like, I'm specialized to come here and teach you guys, but I don't grow my own food, okay? I depend on somebody else who's specialized to do that job, okay? And they make sure that there's enough food at the grocery store for me and my family to eat. Okay? And similarly, if I'm going to drive here, I don't have the ability to drill a well in my backyard and harvest and refine my own fuel. There's other people that are out there that do all the jobs that produce that. Okay? Okay. All right, underneath the upper epidermis okay, is what we call the palisade layer. These are the cells that you're doing your labeling of from the cell anatomy lab. The palisade layer, okay, that's right here. Okay. Those are the cells that you are going to be looking at in the cell anatomy lab, all the ones that are rectangular. They are packed together really tightly, okay. and they're on the top layer of the leaf. So what do you suppose their job is? Right, they're the photosynthetic part of the plant. Okay. The palisade layer's primary job, carry out photosynthesis. They basically do nothing else. Okay. They're packed full of chloroplasts. They're tightly packed in the leaf. Okay, you can see that here, right? Just how tightly packed they are, right? That's carrying out the bulk of the photosynthesis that the leaf carries out. So the palisade layer is specialized to carry out photosynthesis. Um, for our lab, do we have like should we label the epidermis and stuff just because we learned about it? No, I'm just worried about the parts of the cell. Oh, well. yeah. All right. Beneath the upper or the palisade layer is what we call the spongy layer. These cells still carry out a great deal of photosynthesis, okay? Make no mistake, they're still good at that. It's not what they're specialized to do, but they're still pretty good at it. But they're irregularly shaped. The spongy layer um, has these irregularly shaped cells because that creates spaces between the cells that aren't present in the layer above. And what happens in here is the exchange of water carbon dioxide, and oxygen. This is where all the raw materials and waste products of photosynthesis are exchanged. So these cells are just carrying out photosynthesis. Okay? They're, they're going like crazy. But they have to have the oxygen removed, the carbon dioxide brought in, and the water evaporate. Okay? So all that stuff has to be supplied, and that's what the spongy layer does. It creates these spaces where those resources are going to be present and easily exchanged. So that's the role of the spongy layer. Okay? So they're just plant cells, but they're irregularly shaped to produce these kind of reservoirs. Okay? Underneath the spongy layer is another epidermal layer, okay? um, which is secreting a waxy cuticle on the bottom of the leaf. But embedded in that layer are special groups of cells called guard cells. Okay? Guard cells are specialized to change their shape as a result of osmosis. Okay. So as a plant is carrying out photosynthesis, it's using a lot of water. And water is evaporating out through the hole between these guard cells. The hole between these guard cells is called a stomate. So water evaporates out of there. When the water evaporates, the salts that were in it are left behind. Okay. I mean, if you've ever, like, you know, accidentally boiled off water in a pan, all the white stuff gets left behind. All the minerals get left behind. Okay, that's why there's hard water scales on your shower. The water evaporates, the salts get left behind. Okay? So if these salts get left behind, osmosis causes water to be drawn out of the guard cells. And their water vacuoles empty. And when their water vacuoles empty, they can't support the shape of the cell anymore. So the cell flattens and closes the stomate so that no more water evaporates. As the water balance is, is reacquired, the water vacuoles will fill up and the vacuole, or sorry, the stomate will open again. Okay, as these guard cells change their shape. So osmotic pressure, which is the result of carrying out photosynthesis and water evaporating, causes these cells to change their shape. They're adapted or specialized to do that. Okay? actually here okay so these are these are the guard cells so this is what a stomate looks like under a microscope okay each one of these red cells is a guard cell okay and as water evaporates 
out of the stomate, the salts get left behind, okay, and um, water is drawn out, and their shape changes, so the stomate closes. When water moves back in, they become more bean-shaped, and that opens the stomate, and then water can evaporate, and photosynthesis can occur again. Right? So as a plant becomes stressed for water, the stomates close, and the plant stops carrying that photosynthesis. Does that make sense? Right, so that's, again, another example of specialized cells. So you've got epidermal cells that secrete the cuticle. You've got the palisade cells that are carrying out photosynthesis, spongy layer cells that are helping with resource exchange, and you've got stomates made up of guard cells that can change their shape. So these are all examples of specialized cells within a multicellular organism. Okay? Make sure you make a note of those because those are the things you're going to need to explain to me on a test when you're telling me what multicellularity is. Okay. All right, so we'll go over the, the, layer, the layers of the leaf a couple of times because we need to understand what each layer does specifically. Are these going to be on the quiz tomorrow? Tomorrow is just an animal cell. Oh, nice, okay. Okay. All right, I want you guys to answer those. I'll give you a couple minutes here and then we'll go through them together. So, why was multicellularity so superior to unicellularity? What competitive advantage did it serve? Okay, so what are some ideas here? Okay. Bigger is better. Okay, it allowed organisms to become bigger. Okay, it overcame that surface area to volume problem. Absolutely. It's much more efficient if we're looking at it process by process. Okay? Having a master of a skill versus someone who can do a lot of things is way better. You're going to do that job more efficiently. Well, and multicellular like, organisms, if they got like sick or injured or something, they would have less of an impact because like, there's like, different cells, so maybe only a few cells of a certain function would be like affected, whereas a unicellular like organism, everything that that cell did yeah. would be affected. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Injury is much easier to recover from if you're a multicellular organism than a single cell organism. Yeah, a multicellular organism is going to be a bit more adaptive, for sure, um, as a single organism. As a group, single-celled organisms are actually better able to um, adapt to changes in conditions as a Group. So what I'm saying by that is, if I have, let's say, a, a herd of deer, okay, um, and it gets really cold, they're going to be able to adapt to that as a, as a single organism. If a disease comes through, it could wipe them all out. Okay, for a single-celled organism, a change in the conditions it lives in could kill it, okay, and everything else. But because they're so simple, something uh, like a disease coming through is not likely to kill them all. It might kill almost all of them, but if even one survives, it will reproduce and very quickly repopulate. Okay? Not the multicellular organisms don't have that ability to repopulate quickly like single cell organisms do. Would it also help them be a bit more mobile? Uh, well, plants aren't mobile, but they're multicellular. I mean, for an animal, yes, bigger, faster, yeah. stronger. Okay, that's good. Um, how are the cells of the leaf different from cells found in the stem of a plant? Okay, what does the stem of a plant have to do? Bring stuff up and support what's above it. Okay, so it's going to be structurally different. Its cell walls will be stronger. Okay, it's going to be more about um, you know being able to maintain shape and maybe having you know the ability to make vessels that can conduct water and nutrients. Okay, whereas in the leaf. The leaf doesn't have to support anything except itself, okay? and its main job is to carry out photosynthesis. It's going to have way more chloroplasts, less worry about cell walls and stuff like that. Okay? So they'll be structurally different because they're specialized to do different jobs. Okay? Specialization is a word you want to use as often as possible when you're talking about multicellular versus unicellular. All right, number three, describe how the epidermis and the stomates have similar jobs. So the epidermis secretes the waxy cuticle, which prevents what? 
Uh, not so much sun damage, but drying out. drying out. It prevents evaporation, seals the leak, coats and seals it up. Okay? The stomates open and close in response to how much water has evaporated. So they also control evaporation. evaporation. Okay? The cuticle prevents evaporation completely. It doesn't control it, it just stops it completely. The, the stomates, because they can open and close, kind of control it. But they're both in charge of maintaining water balance for a plant. So in that way, they have similar jobs. One just does it by stopping something completely, and the other actually controls it. Okay. So, I'm going to make this, but the cuticle is the wax on top? Or? Yes. The cuticle is the waxy layer. Okay. The epidermis secretes the cuticle. Okay. All right, and describe how the stomate works. So the stomate uses osmosis, okay, water balance to change its shape. So in the mornings, when it's had all night in the dark, okay, water is being reabsorbed because there'll be salt in the area. Water will move towards the salt, and then the, the guard cells will absorb it. Their vacuoles will make the stomates open. Okay? During the day, as water evaporates out through the stomate and leaves a bunch of salt behind, okay, the water is going to be drawn out of the guard cells by osmosis, and they'll flatten and change their shape until the stomate closes. And then again overnight, as water is brought back to the leaf, the salt concentrations will diminish, water will move back into the stomates, okay, and the guard cells will regain their shape. All right? Make sure you're able to explain that. I cannot remember the last time I didn't have a question on the unit exam about how a stone works. Right. So as soon as it's like a higher concentration of salt, it like shrinks Yeah, water moves towards the salt, right? And then overnight, water moves towards the salt from the roots. It takes longer for that process.